Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third in a series of joint webinars hosted by AHDB and BGS discussing herbal lays. My name is Tom Goatman, and I'm the CEO of BGS. This webinar is part of a series of four. The first meeting in July focused on delivering livestock performance and environmental improvements, whilst the second in September discussed establishment looking forward to 2021. We hope you're able to join us on the two previous webinars, but if you're unable to, there are links to the recordings on the AHDB and BGS websites. Tonight, we'll be focusing on considerations beyond the price tag from both a research and practical farming perspective. We are pleased to welcome an excellent panel of speakers for the discussion tonight. After introductions, there'll be a series of short presentations followed by a Q&A session where the panel will be happy to take any questions you may have around the points discussed. The webinar tonight will be recorded and the link made available. I'll now hand across to Steve West from AHDB, who will be facilitating the webinar to outline how it will be managed and introduce our panel. Over to you, Steve. Thank you, Tom. Um, so as Tom says, I'm Steve, I'm, I'm from AHDB. Um, I want to just start by uh, welcoming you tonight and uh, to to just to explain how tonight is going to go. Um, we've got a slot of just an hour between seven and eight. Um, if we're getting a lot of good questions, uh, we may just stretch that by five minutes. So please bear with us uh, because we really want to answer as many of your questions as possible. Um, in the box on the right, you'll see a um, an orange arrow. And if you click on that arrow in there, you will see a question box. If you click on that question box, you can ask any question. They will be anonymous. Nobody else can see them other than us. And we'll ask them without your name uh, in place. So please don't be worried about asking anything um, uh, that you, you think is, is daft, because I'm sure other people will be uh, thinking of the same question. Um, I'm going to ask the questions uh, right at the end. Uh, we've got uh, three well, four presentations from three speakers uh, today. Uh, we were expecting Becky Wilson from the Farm Carbon Toolkit, but unfortunately she was unable to make us uh, make it uh, to, to be with us tonight. Uh, so Hannah Jones, who's one of our speakers, uh, will be covering her slides. So thank you, Hannah, to that for, for that. Um, it remains really just for me to introduce our speakers. We've got an excellent panel tonight. Um, to start with, um, I'll introduce Paul, Paul Newell Price. Now, Paul is a soil scientist at ADAS, um, a chartered scientist and past chair of the British Society of Soil Science Professional Practice Committee, easy for you to say, uh, with over 25 years of research and consultancy experience working on soil and nutrient management issues, principally in the UK, France and Morocco. Uh, he's led a number of applied strategic and policy driven agricultural and environmental projects for the European Commission, DEFRA, Devolved Administrations and AHDB, and currently leads the European Horizon 2020 project on sustainable permanent grassland farming systems and policies, uh, also known as SuperG. This involves 21 organizations across 14 European countries. So welcome, Paul. Thank you. Um, next, we also have uh, Hannah Jones. Uh, Hannah Jones is a farm carbon and soils advisor with the Farm Carbon Toolkit. She's previously taught crop sciences at Dutchie College and at the University of Reading, uh, supervised many students and carried out field research in areas associated with crop diversity. Most recently, she has been part of the SARIC funded diverse forages team at the University of Reading and the Agritech Cornwall and Isles of Scilly funded TOMS project. Both of these projects uh, have focused on quantifying the potential multifunctionality of herbal lays. Hannah's role in both of these teams has been to work closely with, uh, with farmers and ag businesses to quantify herbal lay nutritional value and diversity, as well as assess soil health and floral resources for pollinators. And uh, lastly, but certainly not leastly, uh, we have Rob Richmond. Now, um, Rob is a farmer speaker for today. Rob owns a, a, and manages a, 20, a, 28, a 280 cow herd at Manor Farm in the Cotswolds. Uh, the dairy there produces organic milk from multi-species swords containing 20 different species. 
Uh, the spring block carving cows are predominantly Frisian and shorthorn. Uh, the aim is to produce as much milk from forage as possible, reducing reliance in expensive boarding concentrates. Rob undertook uh, a Nuffield scholarship in, in 2010 and 2011, looking at soil carbon. Uh, this has formed the basis of how uh, he works now, using high varied lays to provide constant ground cover and returning organic materials such as composted farmyard manure and slurry to the soil. So we'll kick off today. Um, I'll hand over to Hannah, I, I believe. Uh, so Hannah is going to uh, uh, cover Becky Wilson's slides uh, to start with and uh, over to you. Good evening, everybody. I'll wait for my slides to appear. They should appear any minute. One okay, second. I look forward to it. <laughs> there, we, there we go. Not quite there yet for me. One second. So a bit of a technical difficulty. We'll just deal with that. Um, there we go, okay. So they were showing, Chloe, there we go. We're on, great. We're That's on, we're gone, over to you, Hannah. So apologies. Okay, okay. all right. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm talking on behalf of Becky Wilson, um, who's a colleague of mine today. Um, so um, her our particular focus in the Farm Carbon Toolkit is to look at carbon dioxide emissions and we're going to use a herbal, herbal lays as a sort of focus to consider this on farm. So if you can consider um, diverse wards to a simple grass um, lay, first of all you can see there's going to be immediate reductions in fertili fertiliser um, use um, because of the in in introduction of legumes but um, Herbal lays, uh, quite often we just think of white clover, but if you extend that across um, the diverse range of legumes that can be included into herbal lays, um, such as lucerne and sanfoin, um, you um, have potential to maintain that nitrogen fixation across a range of conditions, including drought conditions, which will obviously knock a white clover back very severely. Um, research, um, the second point here is um, recent research that was carried out by a New Zealand group, Luo et al, in 2018, has showed that the herbs can actually influence some of those nitrogen dynamics that are taking place in the soil. I think this is quite early days, but this, this research group found that plantain can actually reduce the loss of um, nitrates in the soil under waterlogged conditions. So this is denitrification where nitrous gases actually enter the air and very heavy um, greenhouse gas potential from those nitrous oxide emissions. So um, the plantain has a capacity to reduce the loss of those nitrous oxide gases, um, but also maintain that nitrate in the soil um, for use by the grasses um, um, for your sward. So um, in a diverse uh, lay, of course, including those legumes, you have the potential to improve your feed quality, which I'll cover a little bit more in the next slide. Um, and um, Becky has, um, over a number of years, have been involved in looking at the improved soil health benefits of um, herbal lays or more diverse wards, with particular emphasis on rooting depth. So once those roots go down below 30 centimetres or more, that layer of soil between about 30 and 50 centimetres is where there can be significant improvements in the carbon sequestration of your soils, which can actually have a long lasting effect as far as um, total organic matter is concerned. So as I mentioned, um, with these diverse herbal lays, um, you can include species that can cope with drought. So a standard ryegrass white clover will suffer severely under some of the drought drought conditions we've experienced mid-season um, but some of the farmers I've worked with particularly have been very happy for their stock to continue grazing on their diverse wards which have been dominated by species like coxfoot, plantain and chicory which are and lucerne which can actually cope with the drought because they are so deep rooting. Um, next slide please. 
So um, some of the calculations and um, ballpark figures that um, Becky wanted to present to today. Um, so with a, a high legume sword, um, many of you are probably very familiar with the fact that it's not unreasonable to get 180 kgs of nitrogen per hectare um, fixed per year. And um, over 100 hectares, um, this is about 52 tonnes equivalent of ammonium nitrate. Um, so not only um, so financial savings, considerable financial savings, as well as reducing your carbon footprint in the region of 146 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent over 100 hectares. So um, the, um, one of the main goals um, across the UK is to improve um, uh, homegrown feed. Um, so if we just look at um, diverse swords with those um, range of legume species in just and the grasses. Um, if we look at carbon dioxide emissions, so a 16% crude protein, so CP stands for crude protein, equates to about 0.5 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. So if you think about more on-farm forage production, you're saving money, but again, obviously reducing carbon dioxide emissions. So um, one of the key aspects of herbal lays is because of the diversity of species, you um, are unlikely to get that very rapid peak growth early season, which is um, April, May time, which is dominated by that really vigorous growth of um, perennial ryegrass, followed by some of the white clovers. But in the diverse wards, you will not, you're unlikely to get such a peak in growth at that time of year, but um, because of the diversity present, you will get later season um, forage availability. And in this way, you can actually extend quite commonly the grazing season and also reduce buffer feeding. So each week, those your stock stays out. Um, you can reduce your carbon footprint by about 0.35 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. So uh, for a 100 cow herd, Staying out for one more week, you're saving about 35 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. And finally, um, as I briefly mentioned in the previous slide, those deep rooting plant species um, can sequester a lot of carbon that can stay in the soil for a much greater length of time um, because of those deep rooting capabilities. So when thinking about herbal lays, um, the, there's a, a real story coming out as far as the organic matter and carbon dioxide emissions um across a farming system okay thank you lovely Th thank you hannah uh that's fantastic so um we'll um we'll um, we're getting questions already that are coming in which is fantastic please do keep them coming um i'll put some of those to hannah uh when um we've uh we've We've got through the rest of the presentation so uh, thank you Hannah we'll hand over to Rob and um, Rob over to you yeah could someone just put my camera on I can't find that perfect right um I want to follow on really from that but from a practical point of view um interestingly hannah said about um storing carbon at depth from uh 20 to um from uh, 30 to 50 centimeters i struggled to find uh enough soil to dig a hole 30 centimeters deep on our farm with um, shallow soils over limestone. But what we have achieved over 12 years is shown in the photo um, there. That is 12 inches of evenly dark soil. When we started, the, th the top three inches had um, a light brown color. Everything below that was a limestone yellow color. With 12 years of grazing herbal lays, there's now um, 12 to 14 inches of dark soil, which is a huge amount of carbon sequestration. Um, next slide, please. So to achieve this, we've got to focus on managing photosynthesis. Can we go? Um, so photosynthesis 
it's governed by the amount of leaf area on a plant. The more sunshine we can harvest, the more carbon dioxide and water we can turn into sugar to grow a plant. A plant is 95% carbon, hydrogen and oxygen and only 5% other nutrients. So most of it is coming from carbon dioxide and water driven by sunshine. Rotational grazing these swords, increasing leaf area of the plant produces more sugar. This produces more growth. And as the plant gets bigger, it provides, produces a surplus of um, sugars, which it then feeds to the soil organ organisms. These use some of that for um, respiration, but some of that sugar is built up into stable carbon compounds and stored in the soil. If we look at the next slide, that shows this in a diagrammatic format. Next. Um, so at the top of the slide, we've got a plant straight after grazing, very little leaf area with a decent root system. As that plant starts to regrow, as we go around to the right, um, that leaf area can't feed the whole root system. So some of that roots, peripheral root system is shed off. And then as the leaf area continues to expand, it starts to reboot those root systems. With a ryegrass plant, each of the first three leaves is reproduced in the same time scale. The first leaf contains 15% of the dry matter, the second leaf 25%, and the third leaf 60% of the dry matter. That shows the difference as you get more leaf area, capturing more sunshine, producing much more growth. With the um, ryegrass sward, you go from the bottom right hand corner back to grazing again. But with these diverse swards, we can maintain quality um, up to a much taller um, stage of plant growth. So enabling us to grow a lot more leaf area on the field. This leaf area um, captures a huge amount more sunshine, fixes a lot more carbon, and that then feeds the soil and builds the soil carbon. And that is how the whole cycle works. And grazing that plant before it starts to um, set seed and rebooting the cycle helps keep as much growing leaf area on the field as possible through the year. Um, if we look at the next slide. So by doing this, you're managing to grow your soil rather than spending it through fertilizing it. Next slide. The results, um, a huge amount of carbon sequestration. The more I look at what we've achieved over the last 12 years with herbal lays, I think that 25 tons carbon dioxide per hectare per year is becoming more and more conservative. Um, we've massively increased pasture production and quality, um, growing far more pasture, much more reliable, especially in the couple of dry summers we had than what we could ever do with um, nitrogen and ryegrass. It's improved water management. Um, these soils are much more friable, much more open. They're absorbing rainfall, holding on to rainfall, and the plant's able to access that um, extra moisture in dry periods and keeps growing much, much longer than it used to do. The soil mineral balances in the forage are improving over time and it's having a huge beneficial uh, effect on wildlife. So going forward with what they're talking about for the new subsidy schemes, these, um, these pastures tick all the boxes. Um, Next slide. So what, what we're achieving through all this is capturing the sun to create soil, create ecosystems, and most importantly, create production. Thank you. Right, thank you so much, Rob. Um, and. Uh, Thank you. We've got a load of questions that are still coming in for you. So, so thank you very much for that. Um, 
I'll uh, I'll ask those to you in a moment when we uh, when when Paul's finished his piece. Uh, but in the meantime, for the audience out there who thought they were going to get away without uh, with just listening, uh, we're going to ask you to do something now. So um, we've got three polls in in today's um, present today's webinar. The first of which is how much do you spend on nitrogen fertilizer per year? This is what we'd like to know from you. Um, you'll, you should see a, a blue screen that flicks up now uh, with the question on, and you should be able to uh, select one of those um, one of those uh, areas, one of those tick boxes. So um, we'll just leave you for a moment to to just have a bit of a think about what that that amount might be. I can see we've got. People are voting, which is great. Um, and we're just going to um, there we go. We'd we're just getting there. Hopefully that's gonna work. So there we go. Right, so hopefully you can see that. I know it can be a bit clunky. So um by the looks of it, um most people are, are spending um hang on i'll just close my screen uh so 27 percent are at the 60 to 120 pounds per hectare per year um we've got around around the same amount 22 23 percent for uh 30 pound per hectare and 30 to 60 pound per hectare per year uh those that are above 120 hectare per year um Clearly, we've got the right audience there. Um, we, we're down to seven percent, but I know how how that can happen. And uh, and then we've got twenty three percent who are organic. So fantastic! I think that does shed a bit of light on on some of the audience out there, so we can all see um, see where we are. So um, what I'll do now is I'll I'll invite Paul to come to the stand, and we'll we'll hand over to Paul for for your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Interesting poll there. Looks like we have a representative uh, audience tonight with perhaps um, fewer organic than uh, the British Survey of Fertiliser Practice would suggest. But um, anyway, um, yeah, so for this, for this evening, I'm sort of cheating a little bit because I'm talking about herbal lays, but I'm also talking about uh, multi species swords in a permanent grassland uh, context, because I think there's a fair bit of fluidity on farms and people are interested to know about herbal lays within arable rotation, but also um, multi-species swords within, this, within a sort of more of a permanent grassland situation. So it's from a sort of super G, the sustainable permanent grassland uh, project perspective, as well as the herbal lay perspective. So yeah, I'll, there's all sorts of benefits or potential benefits with herbal lays or multi-species swords. I just want to touch upon um, the carbon story uh, initially, and then I'll come on to the nitrogen fixation and sort of benefits for livestock performance. But I uh, just wanted to put some of the carbon benefits of herbal lays and multi-species swords into perspective, really, in, into context. Um, and I think there's no better sort of evidence for this or, or um, so data for this than from the long-term experimental sites. Um, one of the principal ones being at uh, Rothamsted uh, and Woburn. And th these these uh, diagrams here, courtesy of uh, David Polson uh, from Roth Rothamsted Research. So yeah, the potential for sequestering carbon, so storing carbon, adding more carbon to your soil, it depends on your soil type a lot um, and your so initial conditions, where, where you're coming from, where you're hoping to go to. So. In this situation, we've got, we've got high field, uh, three different fields, high field and fosters, they're both silty clay loam soils. And then at Woburn, you've got a, um, a sandy loam soil, slightly slightly lighter soil type. Um, and here along the x-axis, you'll see number of years, and it just shows how long it can take to change the carbon content of, of soils normally. Now for high field, you, the situation here is where we're going from a, a, a a field which had been in grass for over a hundred years, uh, and then the, the management was changed. Um, so we've got in one situation the triangles represent where the situation where they were trying to improve productivity by sort of adding um, a little bit of nitrogen fertilizer and a bit of a reseed, 
some more productive grassland, you'll see th the triangles there resulted in, in an increase in carbon over 40, 50, 40, 50 years or so. You're getting a slight increase in carbon and then it sort of plateaus out. Um, the other treatment was it going into an arable rotation where you get, you get a fairly rapid reduction in the amount of carbon in the soil due to basically there being um, part of the year when there's not a crop growing. Um, basically, if you've got continuous vegetation cover, you're photosynthesizing a lot and you're, cut, you're storing quite a bit of carbon and basically the balance between photosynthesis and uh, respiration is pretty good. As soon as you start removing the crop in an arable situation or a bare fallow situation, you lose a lot of carbon as that chart on the left shows. The foster situation is slightly different. The starting point there is, is the um, field will be down to arable for a long time. It shows there that um, when you put it down to grassland, you can get quite a rap relatively rapid increase in carbon content. And that's the sort of situation we've got at uh, Rob's farm, Rob Richmond's farm, where he's able to sequester a lot of carbon very quickly. And by using the herbal laser or the multi-species swords, he's probably accelerating that process. Um, so, so doing it as, as quickly he probably, as you possibly can. Again, at Foster's there, you see when it goes, it, when it continues in the arable rotation, you continue continuing to lose a bit of carbon, but it does sort of stabilize out. It does re reach equilibrium uh, uh, eventually. The last chart there on the right is Woburn, uh, which demonstrates what happens when you're in a sort of lay arable rotation. Um, so it just shows with the lay rotation. So this is three, three years of grass followed by two years of arable. You start to get this sort of slight increase in carbon content, or at least you get stabilization of the carbon content, but it's it's relatively low level of increase. Um, uh, not as spectacular as when you're putting it down to grass or a sort of long-term multi-species ward. Um, when it was left in the arable rotation, you continue to lose a bit of carbon there. So this just this just shows different um, uh, perspectives depending on your soil type, your starting point, and and the land use. The thing to remember here is that uh, in all of these long-term experiments, they're just looking at the top 23 centimetres of soil. Um, so we've heard already that we need to think about um, um, the whole the whole soil profile because uh, the, the, the soil stores carbon right down to a, a metre or so. Um, but in terms of perspectives of, of this, what can we do with our grasslands, first of all? If we just forward the slide, Chloe, to the next um, image. Lots of you have been thinking about this, and uh, Pete Smith at Aberdeen has given an opinion piece there. Um, do grass and act, act as a perpetual sink for carbon? So can we continually store carbon um, in grassland soils in the long term? If we go on to the next image, here's conclusions from the Rothamsted data is that uh, the answer is probably no. If we consider that, if we're just considering that top soil layer, not considering the layer below it, the evidence suggests that eventually you do le reach this new so equilibrium a plateau. Um, but we want to look into this in a little, more, little bit more detail to see what the effects are further down. So that's what we're doing in the SuperG project. Um, if you look at the next image, it's an image of the Palace Lees plots at uh, Newcastle University. And um, we were hoping to, to uh, sample these plots down to a metre with samples every sort of five centimetre uh, depth to see what the different treatments across these long term plots. This is another long term experiment going on, been going on for over 120 years, I think. Um, and there's various treatments on these plots, some with uh, fine male manure, some without, some with nitrogen fertilizer, some without. We want to look at the long-term effect of those treatments on soil carbon to depth, because that's a, a very important question. And if we just move on to the final image of this piece, just again to put things into perspective, we can do quite a lot with um, herbal lays in an arable rotation, but it's limited in terms of what we can do. If we're going from arable to grassland or arable to multi-species swords, we can get quite spectacular increases in um in carbon content but we probably can't compete with natural forests um the evidence suggests that um the best way of removing atmosphere from the carbon is by restoring natural forests and this is just a, a title from a paper um in nature so last year i think it was 
so yeah but if you if you've got woodland or if you're thinking about um, planting woodland the best time to plant woodland is 30 years ago so um so that that's why uh, defra is putting quite a lot of uh, store in sort of existing woodlands and and planting new woodlands because that can also help but let's move on to the next slide having talked quite a lot about carbon i'll just quickly whisk through these few few slides or few images so this is just looking at um, the nitrogen replacement value of of herbs within herbal lays and multi-species swords uh, that first chart come is just one chart from a series of experiments we did for DEFRA a few years ago. We were looking at um, the issue of compaction in, in grassland and what deep rooting herbs and legumes can do for that. Um, and we had four sites in England and Wales. This is just one of the sites at Victon College, which is a sandy loam site, light soil. But it's just quite a good example of um, the benefit we got in terms of yield from deep rooting herbs and legumes. This was a 14 species uh, mix. Um, and the yield from first cut, you can see there, basically it, it beat the yield we got from the original sward, so, uh, so ryegrass sward, where, where 80, 80 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare have been applied. So that's just for first cut. And as we've heard already, we can get up to 100 to 150 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare fixed by um, these uh, these multi-species swards that contain legumes. So that's That's one so a clear benefit. Um, question is, so how to manage these multi-species wards or herbal lays? And the next image just shows some results, some more recent results from some work we're doing with James Drummond at Limington Hillhead Farm in Northumberland. And James is very interested to know how to manage um, his sort of his his multi-species or or um, grass swards that have had herbs uh, and legumes added to them. Um, and how to manage them from a nutrient management perspective, uh, but also in, in terms of trying to improve the persistency of the herbs in the sward. So we're, we're looking at, we've, we've heard, we've um, sown a variety of species with James's help. We're also looking at the effect of uh, phosphate, nutrition and, and nitrogen fertilizer and whether adding nitrogen fertilizer right at the start of the year can help uh, performance in terms of the swarm, but also the livestock performance. It was just interesting to see here that um, nitrogen added at the start of the season helped the protein content um, in the sward to, to set quite high levels of crude, crude protein. Uh, but you also have to bear in mind by, by adding that nitrogen, we are slightly inc increasing our carbon footprint as well. So it's something to bear in mind, but from a productivity angle, it might be an advantage in that it helps livestock performance. Um, and then the final image just takes us on to that subject of, of the livestock performance, which is the key issue really for the herbal lays and the multi-species swards. How, how does it affect um, daily live weight gain, um, livestock health and the overall, overall performance of, of the, uh, the farm? So here we had um, five blocks um, each um, with a different sward mix. So we've got a, a sort of standard grass clover plantain mix and to that we've added uh, in one block we added sanfoin in the next block we added uh, bird's foot trefoil and then in the final two blocks we had uh, bird's foot trefoil and sanfoin but with uh, slightly different seed rates and it just showed that um, where we'd added the bird's foot, bird's foot trefoil we had the best live weight gains and uh, James was very kindly doing doing the, the weighing on and off of the lambs, this is this is the live weight gain up to eight weeks of age, um, and that benefit carried right through to weaning. So by sort of weaning, there's a sort of five kilogram advantage um, from the lambs that were on the bird foot trefoil, and basically on on the blocks that had a better herb content. So he's pretty pretty convinced that it's um, affecting his his animal performance, improving the lamb animal performance, which also affects carbon footprint, but also business performance. Um, and um, it's, it's good for animal health because it's preventing um, intestinal torsions that he can get with his livestock. Um, certainly gets from the sanfoin and he thinks there's an effect from the bird's foot trefoil as well. So just a few examples of um, the benefits that we can get from sort of herbal lays and multi-species swords. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Right. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Paul. So much, Paul. Right. I can hear myself, so you might just have to mute yourself. There we go. Um, thank you, Paul. And um, I'll hand back over to, to Hannah, if I may. OK, hello again. Um, so uh, the next few slides are going to be a combination of the results from the Dutchie College led Tom's project, which is Agritech Cornwall and Arza Silly funded and the University of Reading led Diverse Forages project, which was um, funded by the SARIC, um, SARIC club. Um, but I'll just interchange between those two. OK, if you could press next slide, please. Um, so um, when we think of herbal lays um, is um, across the farming systems that I've worked with, um, we haven't picked out a significant, um, a significant effect of yield or quality when comparing herbal lays to a farmer's standard lay, which is commonly a ryegrass white clover lay, or comparing it to a um, our control in one of the projects, white clover, white clover, white clover ryegrass lay. Um, so why would you grow them um, if there's no benefits as far as yield and quality is concerned? So um, one aspect um, is to look at um, what effect do herbal lays have on foraging resources for pollinators? So in this slide, can you press the slide, please? That, oh, go back. They're animated. Go back, please. Thank you. Um, uh, just press once. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, so in this slide, we've got one of the field trials. On the left is the um, herbal lay, and on the right is the uh, white clover ryegrass lay. And um, if we actually look at the total number of flowering units, next slide, please. There we are. Um, um, across the season, across um, eight different farm systems, um, the total number of flowers in the herbal lay, which is the largest fragment of this um, plot, um, there's more flowers in the herbal lay compared to the farmer's control lays, which varied with the farmers, but also with the binary, which we call the right grass white clover lay. But um, when considering resources for pollinators, it can be a lot more complicated than this. Um, different flowers have different quality as far as their pollen and nectar, and also time of year is very important as well. So early data in collaboration with the Bee Steward um, team at, of the University of Exeter at Tremeau started to pull out that the herbal lays um, have a disproportionate benefit to pollinators because of their early season and late season flower presence. Um, early season they're particularly important for the founding um, bumblebee queens um, which need they need to feed themselves before they can actually establish a nest. Okay next slide. Thank you. Um, so um, one of the questions that uh, quite often comes out when I talk to farmers about herbal lays is a big issue about uh, weeds. How can you how can you control weeds when there's all these uh, broad leafed um, herbs within the lays? So um, within the Tom's project, um, just considering the swords um, across the farms, a, a wide diversity of farms, some just cut systems, some grazed and cut, um, there was just under 10% uh, reduction in the presence of um, grass weeds within the herbal lay um, compared to the binary and control. Um, and in some farms, the effect was much more dramatic. Can you press this just once, please? So in this picture, you can see on this organic farm, um, on the right hand side is the herbal lay and on the left hand side is the rye grass, white clover. And um, there's quite considerable suppression of um, uh, the thistles in that system. OK, next slide, please. So um, we've already heard um, ben oh, we've already heard some benefits as far as oh go slides are flicking. Can you go back, please? Thank you. Um, Sorry about this. I don't know um, what's going on with my technical difficulties. I'll just try and get back to where we were. It's okay. OK, thank you. Um, so we've already heard um, about the considerable benefits as far as um, soil carbon sequestration, as far as diverse sward is concerned. Um, there are a range of other benefits that are sort of being unpicked as far as the soil carbon toolkit is concerned and within the, the sort of final stages of results and the projects I'm involved in. Um, but I've just pulled out one set of data. If you can press the um, next slide, please, if it will work. <laughs> 
Next slide. Okay, um, so this data comes from the um, Diverse Forages project. So here we looked at um, the total number of worms and worm weight across uh, four different replicated trials um, from the Southwest, Northwick, all the way through up to Reading, comparing the control, which was perennial ryegrass with 250 kgs of nightshim per year, compared to three other herbal lays of increasing diversity um, in the yellow, the green, and the blue. And what you can see is there was a significant increase in the number of worms in those herbal lays or diverse wards compared to the simple perennial ryegrass um, controls. Okay, next slide, please. So um, an additional question um, that we uh, wanted to ask is, um, does sward diversity affect the nitrate, nitrate leaching? Um, serious consideration, particularly in some of our, our farms are in um, catchment sensitive areas. So for this, um, some lysometers, I put some lysometers in the ground um, perpendicular to the soil surface. So they were down to about a depth of about 40 centimeters. Could you click on to the next slide, please? Um, so this is a lysometer in the field, and um, this was carried out on replicate treatments across four farming systems um, in the diverse sward and in the control, which is binary, which is the binary, the ryegrass, white clover, and we assessed the nitrate in that that leached water um, over the um, early winter of 2019. Next slide, please. And what we are able to find is by looking at the mean nitrate in the control compared to the herbal, there was a significant um, reduction in the leached nitrate in those herbal lays compared to the control, which is a perennial ryegrass white clover. Um, there were four farms and on the bottom you can see an NW farm and a TW farm. And both of those farms um, put slurry on in September. And these effects were detected um, over the period of um, Sort of mid-November to mid-December. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, when considering um, herbal lays, um, even though it's difficult to unpick um, real differences in mean uh, forage yield or forage quality, there are some significant advantages um, that across the board um, many different projects are trying to unpick and um, so I present some of them today. Okay, thank you very much. Right, thank you, Hannah, um, and uh, I'll um, welcome all our other speakers back to to the room if if we've got them. We've got loads of questions, so um, I hope you're all poised. Uh, please do keep them coming in, though. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can. So um, I th I'm going to ask the first question. Actually, I'm going to go back to Paul, if I may. Um, how do you accurately measure soil carbon on carboniferous soils when um, an LOI test will result in loss of carbonates? Paul, you might be on your, uh, I think you're on mute. One second. Right, so try again. Yeah, yeah let's, let's go for yeah. it. So, um, yeah, the most reliable method um, well, it's it's either what what used to be the Walkley Black method, which has now been banned for health reasons. So now it's the do mass oxidation method. So with loss of loss of ignition, yes, you do lose um, all the carbon in the soil, in, including the interstitial water and the clay. So it can exaggerate the amount of carbon that you're measuring. So yeah, the the do mass method is 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 the best one. But we we tend to yeah so certainly on the research projects we tend to do loss ignition and do mass so we can build up a sort of comparative database of of levels. Brilliant. No, that's that's wonderful. Thank you, Paul. Um, uh, we'll go to Rob now, if if we may. Um, so during the dry periods in the last few years. Which on your herbal lays perform the best? Um, primarily the older lays um, held on best of anything. They they recover earlier in the spring. They held on through the dry and as soon as there was moisture, they recovered. But I think that's because one, there's more soil carbon. Two, the... Um, soil ecosystem is, is better established and um, 
and those pastures time after time, even though they're becoming grass dominant, but we are sowing nine or 10 different species of grass in these mixes. And in time, we'll lose the herbs, we'll keep the legumes, especially the trefoils, the samphoins, and um, the older lays are always the more, the more resilient um, and much more productive than um, the young, young lays are, are far more diverse, but when they're really pushed, it's the older lays that, that hang on much longer. Okay, no, well, thank you, Rob. I've got another one for you then that's it's sort of semi-related. Um, are your herbal lays all permanent or temporary? Uh, and do you re-establish periodically? Yeah, a bit of both. Um, there was some really good um, productive lays. The oldest one had been down 12 years um, and still very reliable, very productive. Other lays um, become less productive and will be replaced every sort of five years, grow some whole crop, a turnip crop, and then reseed it back into another lay to keep some some young and some old lays going all the time. Lovely. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Um, we'll give you a break for a second, Rob. We'll go to you, Hannah. Um, the next question is, uh, there's lots of focus on drought tolerances, which is great. Um, are there any herbal lay options for very wet farmland uh, that are increasingly, increasingly tolerant to wet weather soils? Wet weather yeah. and soils, I should say. Yeah. Um, so um, as a rule, the fescues are very good for wet soils. Um, and um, I've seen white clover thriving under pretty soggy conditions. Um, so um, uh, as a rule, um, with with um, yes, yeah, so, so a, a, a fescue dominated sward. Um, but if it's new ground, um, I'd probably cast the net wide and so a very diverse sward and then see which ones start dominating in that particular area of the field. Because quite often fields are very patchy and you might get a very wet area or a dry area. Um, and so a herb will lay, the composition will adjust to those different different conditions. But yeah, but go for the fescues. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Um, I've got quite a general question here, actually. It's, it's about a specific um, situation of a farm that um, is rotationally grazing a spring calving dairy herd uh, at 3.5 uh, LU uh, or above. Um, so relatively intensive, but would a, a herbal sward be able to withstand this intense grazing? Now, it's anybody who wants to put their hand up to answer this. I'm, I'm interested to know all of your, your views. Yeah, I'll have a go. That's right. Um, yeah, these these lays um, in the spring, like growing organically on a very difficult farm at 800 feet on the Cotswolds, we could be grazing on an 18-day round early season um, to stay at to keep up with grass growth up through sort of May June, and then extending that later in the year. Um, Organically, that platform was being stocked at two and a half livestock units a hectare anyway on, on that farm. So on, on good land um, and slightly warmer, then yeah, these lays could, could stand it as long as it gets those rest periods where it needs it. But it, it, can, uh, it can tolerate hard work, definitely. Fantastic, Rob. I don't, I don't know. Paul or Hannah, have you got anything to add on that? Um, I've got, is that right? Yeah, of course it is. Yes. Um, I've got more experience of the swords in the southwest. Um, I found those that are most successful are systems that rely on slurry, um, very specifically slurry. Um, you can the swords become really white clover dominated up to 80 percent in the worst conditions. Um, without slurry application to give that um, uh, grass a boost. So grazing heavily, make sure there's um, there's appropriate um, nutrition coming into the system as well. 
Excellent. Lovely. Brilliant, Paul. Has that covered what you wanted to say or is? Yeah, I think so. I was just a question of what uh, I mean, you're talking about stocking rate at the, sort of at the farm level, which um, ultimately depends on you know, how much nutrition the, the animals are getting. And, and obviously that can be increased through adding nitrogen, but um, that's not necessarily the most resilient way of managing things from sort of business or environmental point of view. But in, ter in terms of the, the, the management of a sort of tall grass sward in rotation, it really just depends on the um, the interval, grazing interval really, and um, providing you can allow the grass to rest for long long enough, then herbal lays, I would have thought, could be incorporated to, to some degree in any system. Oh, I see. No, that's fair enough. Well, actually, related to that, it, Hannah, um, what were the actual um, stocking densities that you used on that trial? It was farm based and I wasn't given the precise densities on those. Oh, um, but I just wanted to add, um, when considering high productivity, we've talked about the nitrogen efficiency of these herbal lays because of the legumes. Um, but you do actually have to keep a really close eye on the P and K's. P's and K's when you've got that level of offtake. Um, right, you are. Oh, I see. Can I just come in there again? Because we've worked these lays really hard on the Cotswolds with lots of calcium, which really favours legumes, and not got to a situation where we've been over dominated by legumes. Like the older lays are still by far the most productive. Um, we'll only be running 30, 40% legume at best. But when you get soil ecosystems really firing well, you can get a lot of free living um, nitrogen fixes, which will actually fix more nitrogen than what clovers will, feeding off sugars off grasses. And where we've been um, trying to boost production, uh, especially over the last five or six years where we've had very little slurry, um, things like applications of molasses, even as low as sort of 10 litres a hectare early season, has far more beneficial effect than early nitrogen and helps kickstart the season, but has a long, um, a long effect over the whole of the season. And it was quite a useful one to use coming out of droughts as well, where there hasn't been much sugar fixed by the um, grasses grow slowed as soon as we've got that moisture just giving the whole system a kick and firing the, the biology up really help for the rest of the season oh brilliant thank you rob <laughs> related to that then actually I'll, I'll i'll piggyback on that um which herb species would you say persist best after five years after a five year after five years um it depends how you how you work this sort. If you create areas of compaction, grazing in wet weather and such like, chicory will stick there for quite a long time. We've seen swords where later on we get quite a lot of yarrow developing, um, and the plantain will will stick in there for a long time. It's, it tends to be the chicory and the plantain will will hold on. Um, some of our soils seem to really suit. Yarrow for some reason. Brilliant. No, that's yeah. great. I um, agree with the. Sorry, I was just going to chip in from from yeah. our from the sites that we've managed. Yeah, so certainly so the yarrow seems to be been uh, doing well. Most of our sites have been medium textured soils. Um, so a few light, few medium, not so many heavy soils. Uh, but um, certainly the plantain, chicory, yarrow have done well. And then, of course, you need to think about the soil pH. So up, up in Northumberland, where we've got the, the swords going in there, um, the farmer James Drummond, very keen on the sandfoin, but on, on his soils, which are a little bit acidic, doesn't tend to persist so well, which is why he's interested in the bird's foot trefoil. So he's hoping that will persist better on his soils. So that, that's, the, that's the hope. So it's, it's very important to think about the the soil texture, so you light land or heavy land, and then also the, the pH is very important from a persistency point of view. Yeah. I see. 
I see. No, that's brilliant. I think that answers that. Um, I've we, we we go off in all sorts of directions here with the questions, but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep asking them as they're coming in. Um, I'd like to just put one to Hannah here, um, just about uh, how many hectares of herbal lay would you need to equal the carbon sequestration of one hectare of trees? That um, is a piece of string question, I know, but uh, but yeah. um, just interesting to put that to you. Um, I would have to look that up. I don't know. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> can, can I, just, I had to just, ask. Can I just chip in on that one? Because yes. there's this huge um, thing where if we need to sequester carbon, we have to go for trees. Trees are great. They sequester a lot of carbon, but they store it in the timber. If that timber is then utilised as wood chip or something like that, you're putting it straight back mm -hmm. in the atmosphere. Whereas grasslands actually sequester that carbon in the soil, which is where it belongs, and have a huge potential to do that as well, and seem to get overlooked on a regular basis. Okay, no, that's that. That's an interesting point. Yeah, I think you also very need important. to think. I think you also need to think about the type of woodland. So um, and coppicing. So if you use coppicing methods, you have a chance to sequester more carbon than an uncoppice system so and also the rooting depth and um, whether you're using the, the land for timber um, and also hedgerows um, so for example if you don't cut your hedgerows every year but every two years you have the capacity to sequester a lot of carbon so I'm involved in a natural capital project which is looking at um, all these sort of different aspects that you know the general goal is not to replace herbal lays or pastures with trees, it's to take unproductive areas in the corner or the margins or to look at fences and look at where hedgerows can be put in place. That's where the carbon sequestration can be gained as far as trees are concerned. Um, and it comes back to the um, share or sparing debate, you know, um, do we spare land for um, these sort of ecological gains or environmental gains or do we try and incorporate it in a herbal lay and in a way I don't think you can really compare herbal lays carbon sequestration with with the value of sequestering carbon in the form of um, hedgerow trees they um, work hand in hand and um, you know as a farm you need to look at all those different options um, together. Lovely thank you um, I'll I'll go back to, to well it, I think this is a combo between Rob and Hannah but actually I think it's all of you. Um, is there any difference uh, in bloat incidence in cattle um, when rotationally grazed on either grass uh, nitrogen-based swords versus multi-species swords? I'm happy for Rob to start and then I'll I can add to that. I'll I'll follow on. Um, I think the most important here is, is getting the plant physiology correct. Bloat is primarily caused by an excess of ammonia gas. Um, if the plant is physio physio physiologically correct, it will be building that, um, that ammonia up into protein. If that's happening, then you have a much less um, tendency for bloat. But at the same time, when you're looking at other um, plants in the herbal layer, you've got plants which are rich in tannins, and tannins are great for mopping up um, excess ammonia in the rumen and carrying it through the animal in the dung rather than it being excreted through the ki kidneys and urine. And that's a much more stable um, way of sequestering nitrogen and keeping it in the sward. So you know, from experience, we we ran into a bloat issue just as we converted to organic. Um, and then I actually applied 100 kilos a hectare of salt across the whole farm. And after that, I think that balanced up the sodium potassium levels in the forage um, and that solved the issue prior to that cows would take lump rocks or like it was going out of fashion. Since that one application, they really stopped 
taking lump rock salt and that application was put on about 10 years ago and it's still the case today so i think that combination of um balancing the nutrients utilizing the nitrogen that's in the sward and um having those tannin rich plants in the sward as well um very much you know makes it a safe thing to graze brilliant hannah um as part of the toms project we're doing some uh, micronutrient analysis of plantain and chicory and yarrow um kind of early data yet but there is a hint that chicory is relatively high in sodium which will sort of support uh, rob's um point on that um still early days so um but and that's 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 interesting um, potentially in the future and um, just as far as bloat on farm and with the farmers that i've worked with um they um some farmers are incredibly relaxed about bloat um, they're not worried at all they haven't experienced it and other farmers just won't go near some of the the herbal lays just because the bloat is such a such a worry um, and there's a whole spectrum there um, with bloat there's a genetic element some stock some cattle are just prone to it and they always will be and then there's an environmental fa factor and then there's something slightly in between so stock that are overwintered um, with um, a silage or whole crop ration are less likely to get bloated compared to those that have got a concentrate dominated ration um, and this is potentially due to the change in the microbiology in the gut um, of, of the stock um, so those go from concentrate straight on to um, a, a rich sward are much more likely to get bloat second part is um, introduce stock slowly um, and make sure they go on um, in, when the sward is dry so some of those bloat inducing chemicals are water soluble so a wet dewy sward will actually um, enhance the problem as well um, and finally um, if stock are introduced to herbal lays it's better they stay on herbal lays rather than switch between a sort of simpler ryegrass sward and then going back on to, to, to herbal lays um, but it's always a case of be very vigilant and just know your stock and your system lovely thank you um so the the next question and for the listeners uh, out there we we've still got most of you on here so um i'm just going to go over by another five or so minutes if that's okay um is there um uh, so to paul uh, i think um is there any evidence that nitrogen in multi-species herbage is better utilized by the ruminants uh cf grass only herbage evidence that it's better used by the ruminants um i don't know of any but um in terms of whether they actually use the nitrogen better hannah and i might have an idea over to you hannah thank you um in the grazing trials that have been done as part of the saric project at cedar the university of reading um comparing um a paddock based system two years um steers across um, perennial ryegrass fed with 250 k um, fertilized with 250 kgs of nitrogen um, compared to those three other diverse herbal lays um, the daily weight gain did not significantly vary between those different systems so um, which is quite interesting that the perennial ryegrass the 250 kgs of nitrogen extra cost was wasted money when compared to the herbal lay so that's just sort of basic growth data that's coming out and there'll be um, more nitrogen data as it's been produced within the next year brilliant no well that's great and actually related to that um there, there's quite a few questions about cost um and considerations on cost when planning herbal lays so um it'd be great to hear what some of the considerations are when planning a herbal lay and the costs so um i suspect rob has a direct uh, some direct knowledge of that um, um you know practical knowledge on on what what you're doing rob but i'm also he keen to hear what everyone's perspective is on that yeah i mean when i first started growing herbal lays back in sort of 2005 um i was persuaded by ian wilkinson at the time to take the cheapest herbal lay which was stripped down lamins mix at that point um because that was the cheapest one and the closest to the cost of a ryegrass clover lay. 
on the back of seeing what happened with that and the more I read and learned, I gradually increased the number of species until about the last five or six years we've been fairly settled on a 20 species mix, which has um, so nine or 10 grasses, five legumes and five herbs in it. And pretty much all of that grows, establishes and does a good job. And I think that seems to work well for the farm. And I think it's, it's worth its money because it is considerably more than what a ryegrass clover sward would cost, but it's going in for five plus years and producing forage that a ryegrass clover sward wouldn't do on the farm that we're on. So, um, yeah, it, it's definitely money well spent. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. Uh, over to you, Hannah. Um, so seed cost is quite often highly prohibitive as far as trialling herbal laser are concerned. And also um, it can be quite confusing when you're looking at a whole range of different species you've never come across before. So there's kind of two methods that you can use um, if you're just starting off um, and you need convincing and you just want to do a couple of fields to see how it goes. Um, just from our trials, um, I would recommend just going with uh, four species, white clover, plantain, chicory and ryegrass. And um, this is a shame it's a sort of medium soil, not particularly dry, not particularly wet. And just getting used to handling the grazing and the cutting of that lay, particularly in how the chicory behaves and when it bolts and, and such like. So that's one option um, to increase your confidence. Another way is to cast your net really wide and to go for a 30 species mix, um, for example, the one that Rob probably is, is using and to use something like um, uh, an identification key so as part of the Tom's project we're developing an app um, which is um, being part it'll be out within a couple of weeks um, where you can actually monitor the species on your sward so it will help you identify the species and you can see which ones are dominating within your sward so you know that actually on your soils under your conditions you may only need to buy a seed mix that's got 12 species in it and you may not need to buy 30 species so there's kind of two options either go with a simple four species or potentially cast your net wide and then do some botanizing and um, identify what you've actually got in your field so and as far as the farms are concerned as far as costs and additional costs are concerned and i don't come across it um mentioned very much um uh, is it 2018 which was incredibly dry and um, the farms farmers i worked with um didn't have to buffer feed on their herbal lays and they did have to elsewhere and that doesn't quite often come up in costings um and i think it's quite considerable and often we talk about herbal lays looking at digestibility or protein and actually those farmers i was working with were just pretty glad they had some forage they weren't particularly worried about a two percent drop in digestibility under those conditions excellent no, lovely and thank you for that um so it's still related to cost, I guess. Um, we, we do have a farmer who um, they're struggling to grow lucerne and uh, samphoin without adding tons of lime every year. Is there anything that can be done? I suspect that's a question for Paul. Um, no, well, if, they, if they're on a naturally acidic soil, then I, I wouldn't try and fight, about, fight against it too much. Um, right. So, so try and select species that are more adapted to the to the soil type, really. Um, as 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 Hannah and Rob were saying, so so if you if you go for a range of species that are, are more adapted to your to your soil type, so if you're lower lower pH soil, then for example, bird's foot truffle might be better than uh, samphoin, for example. Um, and then think about what what you're trying to achieve and what, what the future is for that sward. So you might want to start off with quite a high herb content, but then make sure that in the background there, you've got some species that will persist into the longer term. So you've got grass, clover, and maybe plantain, which will be there and still provide a productive sward, even if the herbs don't persist after the year three or four. Lovely. Thank you, Paul. Um, can I just so, add a comment to that one? Sorry. Of course, please do, Hannah. Um, 
So um, with each of the, the um, legumes, they've got to have a partner bacteria, so one of the rhizobia species, and not all rhizobia species with partner or form a symbiosis with the uh, legume species. So in the UK, we can be pretty confident there's naturally occurring rhizobia for white clover, but on many, many farm systems, um, about 60% that are not the rhizobia that will partner with lucerne or bird's foot trefoil or sandfoin potentially. So um, I had a um, student who worked on this and um, if your pH is in the right range for lucerne, so you need to be seven is ideal, you could probably cope with 6.5 if you're lucky, um, make sure you buy um, your seed inoculated with, with rhizobia. So because that because the, the the bacteria won't be present in the soil um, and um, acidity is really important with rhizobia if your soils are getting are quite acid so i'm thinking about ph6 or below rhizobia um, that are not native like the sort of trifolium ones um, they will actually die and every time you re-sow you have to include your rhizobia species as well um, and it's um, the student um, a phd student who i work with um, uh, Rachel Roberts, she actually found that um, even the productivity of clovers can be enhanced by adding um, appropriate rhizobian inoculum. So um, we work with legume technologies and they, they produce um, very cheap um, rhizobia, which can have a massive effect on um, the performance of those legumes, particularly, and Lucerne was one of the study ones we looked at. Lovely, lovely. Yeah, I'd agree, P P pH is very important. And, you know, as I, said, I said don't fight against natural conditions, but you do need to try and keep the pH up for, for your legumes. So you might have a soil that's naturally pH five or even even lower. You need to be at six. So, you know, reg, regular liming is very important on, the, on those sorts of soils. I see. I see. But yeah, that, I guess that's another cost consideration. So absolutely. Um, I, I'm just going to I'm going to keep you to two more questions now and then we we've just got one poll and then we'll we'll pull it, pull that to a close so um what another one for hannah um if elms option cover herbal lays uh, but require leaving the sward to flower for pollinators by not grazing or cutting which period is best to let it flower early mid or late season okay um so uh, first of all, um, with elms, and um, before I answer your question, um, there's highly likely to be two options related to herbal lay. So at the moment, there's the GS4, um, which is um, based based on um, income foregone if you put your herbal lay in an arable rotation, which is why it's a quite a, a lucrative um, subsidy, but has all these restrictions based on it. Um, and then there's likely to be an alternative elms option, um, which is just going to be for grazed herbal lays, which isn't going to have the closure time restrictions. Um, so to answer the question about um, closure um, times, um, I think um, the best option is to, um, quite tricky really, it, it depends on your, your system and where you are. Um, in a sort of wetter, warmer cli climate, I would say um, take off your, take off your, um, your good cuts of silage, get your productivity right, and then leave it leave it open from there so um so shut it off there sorry so you're looking at um sort of june um june june time um but then um if um there's options as far as hay is concerned which may be um an interesting um, um intervention in the future you'll obviously um shut it off a bit later in the season so it's quite quite a difficult question to answer um i think um, chicory becomes more unmanageable as the season gets on it becomes more woody and bolts more quickly so rob had his hand up he may be able to add to that yeah thank you thanks hannah over to you rob yeah i mean by the time you get to sort of late may a lot of the clovers and herbs are wanting to head anyway wanting to flower and really from that time onwards um even if we're only on a 25 28 day rotation through june um a lot of those herbs will come into flower and um for the rest of the season you can graze on a 35 to 40 day rotation and have constant flowering for the whole of the year 
So it's it's not a case of, of needing to specifically shut it up. It's just putting the rotation to the right length, and there'll be clovers, trefoils, chicory flowering for the rest of the year um, as as we're grazing it, producing plenty of feed for pollinators. Brilliant. Thank you, Rob. Um, I, that, I'll, I'll ask the last question. The last question I'm going to ask today, and everyone's made uh, my job extremely hard by asking so many good questions. So thank you for that. Um, the question is, um, how do you explain the weed suppression effect of diverse sward versus binary grassland? Um, and I'll let anybody put their hand up on that about weed suppression. Rob? Yeah, I mean, the, the photo that was shown had um, thistles in it. Um, we've had years with thistles, years without. Um, the big issue with thistles is creating compaction. If you create compaction in a field, um, you will get thistles usually about 18 months later. Topping them once they're in flower in July, early August, um, tends to lessen them quite substantially. And looking at that sward where you've got the herbal one side and the um, ryegrass the other, you've got a tighter sward, tighter soil under the ryegrass sward, and a much more open soil under the herbal, especially with the chicory roots in their opening soil up. So then you're less prone to get um, weeds because Weeds paint a picture of what's actually going on in the soil. Taprooted weeds like thistles, um, like compaction. Uh, it's the same same as docks do. Lovely. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Hannah, you've got one last point on that. And uh, just to support Rob's um, Rob's point there, when I assessed that trial, um, there was significantly more worms in that herbal system than in the ryegrass. And I should say that. That wasn't a strip grazed um, field um, and it was dairy, organic dairy grazed. Um, so there was no differentiation between the amount of compaction. So any relief of compaction is just due to the rooting systems, which uh, Rob's mentioned. That's that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm afraid that um, that draws us to the end of the questions. We, we've I've still got a load of unanswered questions. I know that um, a lot of those questions were on establishments, um, and um, they a lot of those will have been covered in the previous Herbal Lays webinar, uh, which you can find on YouTube. Um, and uh, we, uh, if if you've got a problem uh, finding that, uh, do do email us, and we'll uh, we'll send you the link. But I'll um, I'll talk to Suan and uh, Chloe about making sure that uh, the links to all webinars are sent out um, afterwards. Um, and anything on feeding and grazing, uh, we've covered a little bit today, but they should be covered in the next webinar in March, uh, which you'll uh, all get an invite to. Um, in the meantime, I know we've, uh, we're losing a few people now, uh, we got below the 100. Um, so I'm going to ask the poll here. I know we've overrun. Um, after hearing this discussion, we're really keen to, to know the answer to this. After hearing this discussion, how do you feel towards growing herbal lays? So if you could tick uh, which of those is most, um, most applies to you, I'd be really grateful. Um, and as always, both ourselves at AHDB and at um, our friends at BGS, we're always keen to um, get questions or um, uh, answer questions, certainly about uh, about what you might need or any information you need. Uh, and it does help us to put put this type of um, uh, digital output together. Um, so always keen to know. So that's fantastic. We've got more than half of you uh, are likely to grow uh, and more than a third are already growing so that's fantastic so I'm hoping that we've we've added at least something to uh, uh, you know our fantastic speakers have, have added something to, to the knowledge out there um, so it's thank you from me and I'll hand back to Tom Goatman just to, to round up if I may thanks Steve um, yeah so uh, 
a, a great amount of information we've covered the, to, this evening. So I was just going to pull out a couple of points from uh, each of the presentations. So um, firstly, from, from Hannah's um, initial presentation, um, just outlining some of the benefits um, um, of herbal lace in terms of nitrogen fixation um, and reduced uh, nitrous oxide emissions and also improved soil health benefits um, in terms of carbon sequestration, particularly down to um, to greater depths of, of 30 to 50 centimetres. Um, then we've gone to Rob. Rob, Rob um, uh, also highlighted the improvements in um, soil organic matter um, with those uh, the, the pictures there that we saw of the, um, uh, of the 12 inches of an evenly dark soil. Um, and uh, Rob highlighted the key to, to building that um, soil organic matter is uh, an understanding and optimising photosynthesis in terms of uh, leaf area and ma uh, maximising the, um, um, the capture of, of sunlight um, and, and then um, ultimately turning that into um, uh, ca capturing that carbon into the soil, uh, creating e ecosystems and then benefiting from the, um, um, from the production advantages of that. Um, Paul highlighted um, uh, the need to understand that different soils um, types um, have different abilities to capture carbon um, um, and again I also highlighted in terms of the, the long time scales that we're looking at um, when we're looking at building um, soil carbon. Um, he also highlighted that um, grasses may not act as a, a perpetual um, carbon sink um, with, with that data there showing a, a plateau in effect um, in that experimental uh, work. Um, and the greatest potential may be in, in, in arable systems in terms of um, uh, in terms of them improving the, the soil carbon content through with multi-species swords. Um, Hannah then in her final presentation um, uh, discussed the wider benefits of, 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 of multi-species swords and particularly in relation to pollinators and um, particularly highlighted um, the benefits in terms of um, providing an early and late season uh, food resource for pollinators which is, um, um, which is very important. Um, and also highlighted the benefit in terms of um, worm populations and linked to that in the final part of the discussions there in terms of weed suppression, in terms of um, getting that, um, um, you know, there's a better root structure there and helping in terms of uh, um, weed control. Um, so there was, there was lots of points covered there. Um, so there is a recording of, of, the, uh, of the webinar tonight if you'd like to go back and, and catch any, um, you know, the discussions again um, to just go over a few, few of the points. Um, but I, um, I'd like to thank um, uh, Rob, Paul and Hannah for their time tonight. And it's been really useful and a lot of good information covered. Um, so it's been fantastic. And particularly thank you to Hannah for stepping in at the last minute to, to help with that um, first presentation. So thank you very much, Hannah. Um, also thanks to um, Steve, who also stepped in at the last minute to facilitate the um, discussion tonight. So that's a great job, Steve. And also Chloe and Sian who are working hard behind the scenes in terms of the uh, technology. Um, just as a final few points before we close, I'd just like to highlight that the fourth webinar in the series will be on uh, Wednesday the 3rd of March, um, where we'll be focusing on feeding and grazing management. Um, so uh, as, as Steve said, we'll be, uh, there'll be a diary invite sent out um, regarding that. Um, and I'd also like to just highlight the uh, 2021 BGS uh, research conference on multi-species swords. Um, so this was uh, supposed to take place uh, in March 2020, but due to COVID, um, we were unable to, um, to, to complete a face-to-face -face event. So it will be held online now um, in the week commencing the uh, 1st of March. Um, and the sessions we're looking to cover will be establishment, swore management for grazing and conservation and utilising and feeding value. Um, so please um, keep an eye on the BGS website where we'll post further information and details um, uh, uh, and uh, we'll also uh, highlight when booking opens for that. Finally, I'd just like to thank everyone for um, uh, attending tonight's webinar. I hope you find it all interesting and I wish you all a, um, a good Christmas and a better 2021. Um, and with that, um, we'll, we'll sign off for this evening and hope to see you all again in, in March for the, uh, for the fourth and final uh, webinar in the series. Thank you very much. Thank you.